This is the Language of Business, a show to inform and inspire entrepreneurs and anyone thinking about a startup. Hear about strategies that work and strategies that often don't work from people who've been there and done that. Our host is Gregory Stoller, Harvard MBA and senior lecturer at Boston University Questrom School of Business. In this episode, we look at a fresh approach to business. The key? Outsourcing everything you can, like hiring MBA moms, and a way to help Fortune 500 companies find success. Hourly nerd. The name didn't work, but the idea exploded. But first, we find out about a Pinot Noir and Sauvignon Blanc from Oregon that not only taste great, they help save bees and sea turtles and oysters. Here's Greg Stower. Imagine running a business where you give 13% of your revenue away. We're on location at the New England Aquarium with the co-founder and CEO, Brian Thurber, and welcome to Language of Business. Thank you. How does Proudpool work? So we support a network of 22 environmental nonprofits, including the New England Aquarium, with alcoholic beverages that are sustainably produced in high quality. So we have our three here. Uh, this is our Sauvignon Blanc from California. It supports wild oyster reef restoration, including in Massachusetts, wherever you buy it. Neat. Uh, this is our Oregon Pinot Noir for the bees. We plant okay. bee habitat on farms. Yep. And our latest, Cider for Sea Turtles, uh, supports New England Aquarium and other sea turtle hospitals across the US. When did you found the company? So my business partner gets all the credit for the sort of initial idea. Uh, Berlin Kelly's her name. Yep. She started in New York City in 2014. Okay. She was uh, uh, really into the New York City Home Brewers Guild, doing a lot of fermentation as a hobby, and a lot of friends starting wine and beer brands. And she saw a movie called Shell Shocked, which is about wild oyster reefs. Sure. And she realized she could tie that to delicious drinks for the planet, and that's what started our Sauvignon Blanc. And how did you arrive at 13% as being your nonprofit giveaway? Well, it, it's a little bit because we uh, were outsiders. We kind of backed into it. We started giving away a lot of money to our partners, enough to restore 100 wild oysters per bottle and then plant 90 square feet of bee habitat, and it was 13% of revenue that did those numbers. So we've actually, it's allowed us to have a big impact. So we've restored 11 million oysters with the Sauvignon Blanc and 68 acres of wildflower habitat on farms. And where do you produce the wine and the cider? So we work with very high quality producers across the US. Um, the wines are West Coast, so it's California Sauvignon Blanc and Oregon Pinot Noir, and the cider is actually local here in Massachusetts. How do you find the nonprofits, and more importantly, how do the nonprofits find you? That's right. So we have, I have an environmental background and a law background, and we talk to a lot of people. We ask them, who do you really respect? Who's doing the best restoration work? And we went to the International Conference on Shellfish Restoration and just met everyone. We talked to everyone. And this is your full-time job? It is. And how did you decide to do this as your vocation? Well, so I have an environmental background, as I said, and it's just an important passion of mine. And I realized that alcohol was an amazing way to bring people together around a story that really matters about the planet. Who do you view as your competition? Well, so a lot of uh, winemakers and brewers will do one-off products for pet causes that they sure. care about. So it might be something like pet adoption or breast care. By the way, the penguins seem to really like your answer, by the way. Yeah, we have, we have penguins as neighbors. Uh, they're commenting a lot. Um, so, so there are a lot of one-off products that brands will do, but it's not really, and that's great, but it's not the central focus of their company, the sort of giving back to their partners. Um, so I think we're pretty unique in that we are founded around this social environmental mission. I love it, I love it. Uh, what do you consider your exit strategy to be? We don't have one. Um, we are gonna become a Patagonia level brand that sure. is touching people with really important environmental narratives and supporting all of this really important um, environmental work. So for instance, next year we're gonna launch our Rosé for Reefs. It's gonna be our Chardonnay for Sharks the year sure. after that. So we're gonna do everything. What keeps you up at night about the business while you might be feeding the fish? <laughs> so what keeps me up at night, we're bootstrapped. So we never took a check from an investor. It's just our small life savings put into the company. And that's been great because we, we can do this the way we want to do it. But it also means we don't have a ton of money in the bank. So we have to keep scrapping and kind of growing it organically. It's, it's definitely an interesting challenge. What would be one piece of advice that you have for an entrepreneur? I would say when you're going to do something, Try to do one thing different. So these are high quality, sustainable wines. And the thing we do that's different is trying to tie people into this environmental work. When you do one thing that's different, uh, it doesn't confuse people in the market. Can you see yourself doing this, say, 10 or 15 years in the future? I, I sure can. Yeah, I think that there's all sorts of room for exciting stuff for us to do. Congratulations on what you've accomplished so far. Thank you. Brian Thurber, the co-founder and CEO of Proud Poor. My name is Berlin. I started Proud Pour. I started this company about three years ago because 
I was living in New York City and going out at night and spending a lot of money and time drinking. And I thought, wouldn't it be really cool if we could drink to make a difference? We create vegan, organically grown wines, and then we use the sails to restore bee habitat or oyster reefs and allow people during happy hour to make a change in their local environment. I'd always wanted to start something, but I didn't really know what. And then once I came across this idea of, oh, oyster reefs, I'm overlooking the harbor from my Wall Street office. and. I had no idea that this used to have 220,000 acres of oyster reefs. And this is important and people need to know. That's where I started, I just followed that. The bees is really great because people know that there's problems with bees, so we launched that Pinot Noir. We work with Xerces, which is a pollinator organization, uh, the largest one I believe in the US, and they're based here in Portland, to basically plant more flowers along the perimeter of farms. When I visit farms like Headwaters that we went out to, it's such a nice experience to be able to see all the work that we've been working so hard to, to have happen, happen right there and, and to yeah, kind of be able to come home and see all the, the flowers everywhere and the bees and all the different species of bees that are there. Um, it's really special. I think everyone is original. I just think people get sucked into wanting to have approval from their society. An original is just somebody who's maintained that <laughs> or, or rekindled that in some way. My name is Berlin and I am an American original. Theory says to outsource whatever isn't core to your business, but practice is a whole lot different. This doesn't only include strategy, but also the open nature of your office concept. We're on location with Mark Landgren, CEO of Nexus Group. Thank you for joining us. Let's start by having you explain how this open concept helps your corporate culture. We have a lot of fairly young folks in here, a lot of millennials, and although they like the openness, uh, we were surprised to find that they wanted some privacy. And uh, so some of our cubes provide privacy, but it, it's a pretty open office otherwise. But I, I think that we've found a pretty good balance. Um, you know, I'm old school, used to offices and, and closed areas and big cubes. But I think we've gone with the smaller cubes and uh, I think it's worked pretty well. Following your own business model, would you consider letting 50% of your workforce work at home? But well, we do have a percentage of our workforce that do work at home. And what we provide, we provide laptops to everyone. So on bad weather days, for example, most of our um, office does work from home. So we have that capability. So yes, we are advocates of working from home. But what we find is a lot of our employees like the atmosphere here and actually like being around their colleagues. Instead of outsourcing, why not bring someone in-house permanently as opposed to using a company like Supporting Strategies? for many, many years, probably eight to 10 years, it just wasn't worthwhile. We were able to get a number of different levels of service from supporting strategies, from your sort of bottom level uh, bookkeeping services all the way up to sort of CFO services. So it was just, from my standpoint as a CEO, it was just another thing I didn't have to worry about that wasn't core to our business. And was it really a black box? You could immediately outsource it and not think about it? Um, I wouldn't say at the beginning it was necessarily, but uh, the, the folks from Sporting Strategies were, were very, very helpful. Um, and a actually, when I, I outsourced very soon after I came into the business, um, and I was the de facto CFO and COO, general counsel at the time, um, so I wore many hats, and the more I could outsource, the better off I was, and, and they could do a much better job of it and focus more uh, than I could on it. As your business is growing, would you consider outsourcing different revenue streams, not just the costs? It's funny because our business, in effect, is, is an outsourcing um, alternative for a lot of our retailers. Um, we 
are, are in a position where we focus just on scan-based trading, and a lot of these large retailers' main business is to sell product. Right, the wall so of the world. That's right. exactly right. So, so what we have found is we can provide a better service because we have more folks that are just completely focused on this, and, uh, and we found that we, we can do it a little bit more cost-effectively and a little more efficiently. What is the difference between outsourcing a revenue versus outsourcing cost? We have looked at that. Uh, we haven't done it yet. I mean, outsourcing a, a cost is, is an expense item that we uh, would incur. And uh, you know, as I said, that we chose for a long time to, to outsource to supporting strategies because that was their core business and not ours. As your customers are outsourcing to you, do they think of you as a black box? Uh, oh yes, M many of them do. We've heard from a number of our customers is that we handle something that they don't have the time to do. So our business is made up with a lot of components. There's data interchange on a daily basis. There's payments that happen. There's inventory control at shrink. So there are a lot of facets that go across multiple um, departments within a retailer. And we sort of bring that all together for them. What keeps you up at night about Nexus Group? There is a multi-trillion dollar opportunity in front of us. Amazon in their what they call third party sales are, are sales that they do on their website, marketplace sales that they don't own the product, which is similar to scan based trading, is growing at you know over the last 10, 15 years over 50% a year. And this year they're gonna hit over $230 billion worth of revenue there. So one of my biggest challenges is finding out where do we just focus on and what retails and what products do we focus on. What would be the single largest piece of advice you'd give to a new entrepreneur? Um, well, it's interesting. As a sort of a serial entrepreneur myself, um, you know, entrepreneurs have certain traits. They tend to be full of confidence and enthusiasm. But I would remind uh, first-time entrepreneurs that they wear sort of two hats as an entrepreneur. Uh, you're, you're a leader as an operator in the business, and you're also an investor. And don't let that enthusiasm cloud your views as an investor, because oftentimes people will take what they perceive to be the best idea since sliced bread, and they'll pound it in the ground even after they realize that there's no real marketable um, use for that. So don't get stuck doing that. Mark, thank you. You're very welcome. If you sell merchandise to retail stores, chances are you go about it in one or two ways. You deliver directly to the stores and you merchandise the product, or you deliver the product to the retailer's warehouses and the retailer merchandises the product. You invoice the retailer and wait for payment. That can take 60 days or longer. When the retailer needs more, you'll either get a purchase order or you'll see what has been sold at your next scheduled visit to the store. There's a better way. It's called Scan-Based Trading, or SBT for short. SBT is similar to consignment and has been used by hundreds of retailers for over a decade. You're paid on what scans through the register, so you always have visibility as to what is selling by SKU, by store, and by day. SBT also allows you to plan deliveries as needed, based on inventory at the stores and warehouses on your routes. SBT is a change and can seem overwhelming at first. It doesn't have to be if you have the right partner. Nexus Group has been educating and partnering with the leading retailers and thousands of suppliers on SBT since 2003. Maximize your efficiencies. Decrease out of stocks. Increase sales. We'll be your trusted guide. Contact Nexus Group today to find out how. How do you expertly manage variable cost recurring revenue and do it well? Confused? You're not the only one, but Steve Schultz certainly isn't. You are with Supporting Strategies and welcome to Language of Business. Thank you. So what does that possibly mean in English? We deliver bookkeeping services for growing businesses. Our typical client, a one to $10 million growing business, needs bookkeeping. So there isn't a business in the world today that doesn't need to pay their bills, pay their people, recognize revenue, go through month and close, um, and generate reports that tell the business owners and the bankers how they're doing. Traditionally in the United States, that's been done by a bookkeeper. They come into your office one day a week, or one day a month, full-time or part-time, depending on how big your business is. Today, we can deliver all of those services virtually without ever coming into a client's office, and they save money. But how do they do it with the numbers? You're not talking about widgets, you're talking about revenue, you're talking about cost, you're talking about the heart and soul of a business. How do you do it virtually? But it's only about us gathering the data. So we have very clever ways of gathering the data. Um, you know, there's still a lot of paper in businesses today. We give all of our clients 
prepaid mailers, eight and a half by 11 inch FedEx style envelopes. And they can simply put a Verizon phone bill that came in the mail in that envelope and it'll get to us. You can take a picture of an of a invoice that comes to you and send it to our secure portal. And we can get those documents today automatically using fetching software that will grab someone's American Express bill or grab their Verizon phone bill and automatically populate it into the general ledger. And you're not trying to compete with the paychecks and the ADPs of the world? So we do manage payroll, but we use ADP to process payroll. So what ADP is doing is they process payroll. They make sure the government gets their fair share and the employee gets their fair share. We're working payroll administration. How much should each person make? Are we, um, do we have employee files for them? So we're payroll administrators. We still use ADP. That's one small segment of what businesses need. And now what we're doing is the rest of it. And so much of your success has been via franchise model. Why bother franchise and why not go direct? You know, we thought our best way to capture the marketplace would be to have local people developing their local market. That middle market, we sell to that one to $10 million growing business. They have a CPA, they have a banker, they have a benefits broker, they have an insurance salesman. These are their trusted advisors. What we do is build relationships in each community with those trusted advisors. It's a channel marketing strategy. We're not knocking on the doors and saying, do you want to fire your bookkeeper? But nobody knows who needs a bookkeeper more than a CPA. If they're trying to do an audit and the books are a mess, they know. Some of your most fantastic growth was in 2008. Everybody was going in one direction, you were going in the other. Now, 11, 12 years later, how are you doing? So, you know, we did great in 08 um, because when times are tough, people are looking to save money and they can save money with us. You know, we tend to say that our service is faster, better, and cheaper. You know, we're, we're outsourcing uh, what was a job, so um, we can scale up with them and scale down with them. So we tended to grow. We grew by over 40% in 2008. Um, since then, the market's been on an unprecedented run, and uh, we're doing great because there's so many businesses out there that are getting started, that are growing. Um, we have our eye on, you know, the storm clouds that appear to be brewing, but again, we're positioned really well to do that. Our business model makes sense to business owners in both an up and a down market. What keeps you up at night about the company? You know, we got what's the unemployment rate in the country is at historically low, low levels and we're growing so fast. Um, can we continue to find uh, good employees? And what's really helping us is because we're finding people um, I like to call our employees MBA moms. And while they're not all moms or MBAs, they're people who want to work from home for some reason. Maybe it's because they want to put their kid on a school bus. Maybe it's because they want to go golfing. Um, so they're not working 60 hours a week. Yeah, our average employee is 25 to 32 hours per week. So that's a niche, um, that's a lifestyle business. So we've been able to grow and, and you know we're up to over 400 employees right now and we're growing steadily. But um, we're certainly seeing the low employment rate and um, having to be a little bit more clever in how we source our employees. What single piece of advice would you give to a new entrepreneur? My greatest advice to anyone is to, again, choose your business model wisely, um, but to focus in on what's making you money. And don't try to do the things that are not driving your passion. You know, you got into business because you like to make pizza or you're developing a better drug delivery system. That's what you should be focused in on. You're making software, selling the software. Outsource to everybody everything that you can outsource, and it's going to help you focus in on what you're good at, making money you know, on some product or service that you sell, and let a CPA handle your tax work and an outsource bookkeeper handle the bookkeeping and so on. Steve, thank you. You're welcome. Steve Schultz, franchising expert with supporting strategies. I didn't even realize what it meant to be in a top tier business school until my first day. And I just really, for the first time, felt like I was in a place where everybody knew what was going on and everyone was incredibly driven uh, to study this and perfect this field. And so I think being in a top business school really means that you are finding the barriers and the edges of the field and pushing them a little farther. And that's what Questrom has taught me over the past four years. The curriculum at Questrom is really helpful because you get to not only study the basics of business, such as accounting or marketing, but you really get to dive further in and to see applications of the health sector and how business applies to sustainability efforts around the world. They really want us to kind of focus it on four emerging areas, and those areas were healthcare, security, sustainability, and technology. Those are really where the jobs are going to be. 
They really want us to come out from the Questrom School of Business and, like I said, be able to work in any area of the industry. How do you make a Fortune 100 company start functioning as a startup? We're on location here with co-founder and co-CEO Patrick Petiti at Catalan Technologies and welcome to the Language of Business. Thanks for having me here. I'm excited to talk. How did this morph from a class project into what you see right now? Well, that's a long story. That's about a seven year story. Um, but the way we started was, um, you know, my experience was I worked at a large consulting firm. Right. Um, and I often found that sometimes the big consulting firm was a good solution for the clients that we worked with. And sometimes they didn't really need this like big team of smart people. What they really needed was the person or the people who had solved the problem before. You, you can imagine what strategy consulting was five years ago. Right. Think about what it is today. Think about the number of digital transformations going on at large companies today. Think about how large companies are being disrupted at a rate at which they've never been disrupted before. Think about the pace of change today, the fact that it's faster than it's ever been before, and today is the slowest it will ever be again. If you're a large company, what you know is that there are a ton of startups biting at your heels, going after one little slice of your business, and the only way for you to be able to, to, to compete with them, to go and transform what you do, is if you can go quickly. So you started off as hourly nerd, you were taking people who wanted to work 20 hours a week and getting 40 hours of productivity out of individuals or teams of individuals. Totally. What happened next? Yeah, so we started hourly nerd. It was very much focused on small businesses, um, hence the name. Um, and we launched a marketplace. It took off and we started to get press and you know customers from across the United States. And very quickly, what started to happen was large enterprises were showing up. They were creating accounts, but they weren't transacting. So in like a two week window, 40 people from GE showed up and made accounts. But none of them would actually post a project on our marketplace. Okay. And we were curious. We were like, well, why? Like we, we believed that there was a ton of value to create at the enterprise level. And we knew that people who were signing up to do work on our marketplace really wanted to work with these big brands. But we couldn't figure out why it was that they weren't engaging anybody. So we went and we just talked to them. Like sure. we've, we've always prided ourselves on being extremely customer centric and not letting our business model, our existing product, our technology, our position get in the way of delivering value to a customer. Okay. So we went and we talked to all those customers. And what we found was that across the board, they all had the same problem. They wanted to be able to leverage the high end of the freelance economy. We, we tend to play with people who have worked at large consulting firms. But someone thinks, Pat, of freelancing yeah. as being graphic design <laughs> or stuff of that ilk. You're talking about strategy consulting totally. or other business service freelancing. How does that work? So sometimes it might look like a boutique consulting firm, but in effect, what they're trying to do is what everybody in the freelance economy is trying to do. Take more control over your life. Not let a job dictate how you live your life. Live the life you want, fit work in, and be able to choose the things that you work on. And so really, the same exact thing is happening across the spectrum of the labor economy, whether it's at more what you might call more commoditized work, all the way up to work that is highly, highly strategic and requires really deep expertise. So give us an example of your most popular project beyond classic strategy consultant. Well, so like a great one is market research. Like I want to be able to plug into somebody who's already worked in an industry, who's launched a product in a certain geography, who has uh, worked at a certain type of company, and I want to be able to get them to come in and help me understand that market. And how many clients do you, are you able to support at one time? Oh, it's pretty unlimited. Like the beauty of our model is, um, and since day one, we've always focused very much on building a technology platform and figuring out how we can use techno technology to make the process of describing what you need, connecting to the right person as seamless as possible. So we can support, I mean, we work with close to 40, 30% uh, of the Fortune 1000. We work with 30% of the Fortune 100. We work with several thousand um, companies that fall outside of that size. Um, and there's, and within those companies, we're working with anywhere from one to, um, uh, a couple thousand people. What keeps you and Rob up at night right now about Catalan? The, the biggest thing to me is we are, met many startups uh, are at risk because they could die of starvation. They can't find enough customers, they don't have enough money, um, they don't have enough opportunities to go and try and grow. For us, I always think about the fact that if we die, it's going to be from overeating. It's going to be because we are, we are disrupting the way companies get work done and the way that people work. And so there are so many different places where we believe we can go and add value. And we have so many customers who are asking us to come and help them in all these different ways. So for us, the, the real trick is how do you make sure that you focus on the right areas and you don't try and take on too much at once. If you had to advise a first time entrepreneur, what would be your single best piece of knowledge passing on? I would say, you know, I think the thing that would have helped us get to where we are today a lot faster is if we had um, 
ignored the existing business model that we'd created. We'd ignored you know, the technology that we thought we should create. And we just were singularly focused on being with a customer and helping those customers create value. Um, because oftentimes, you come up with a great business model, and you think it's the right one. You come up with a good platform. You come up with a good process. You think it's right. And then you try and force that process and that business model on your customer. So for us, we've actually made this pretty, pretty big transition from just being a marketplace to actually being a SaaS company. And that's because our customers wanted to, wanted to have a different business model. They didn't want to necessarily pay entirely through marketplace transactions. They wanted to be able to put in place you know, a software solution that would help them get their work done better and faster. They wanted to be able to go and find their employees instead of people from our marketplace. And you can imagine, like back then when that first, when that first occurred to us, we would, think to our, we would think to ourselves, well, gosh, if we give our customers our technology so they can better find their employees, does that mean they're not going to use our marketplace for those projects? And the answer is like probably sometimes. But the truth is, you have to be focused on the value that your customer needs. And if you deliver value to your customers, then everything else will fall into place. You can't, you can't worry about all the rest. Why the change from the name Hourly Nerd to Catalan? Um, good question. So Hourly Nerd, I think, worked really well when we worked with small businesses. The challenge with the name was what we would find as we started to work with larger enterprises were two big issues. Issue one, well, we don't need the geek squad, or we don't need like technicians. And then we'd say, nope, it's actually high-end business expertise. It's people who worked at some of the great consulting firms out there. It's people who worked in an operating role at a company. And they'd say, but you want me to tell my boss that we hired Hourly Nerd instead of a brand name consulting firm? And we're like, OK, we get it. Um, and so enough of that, and we realized that the name, in spite of the fact that I think it was clever and it really worked well for, for small businesses, we wanted a name that we thought resonated the quality of the people who were working on the platform. And we wanted a name that talked more to the platform than it did just specifically about the people. And what does Catalan mean? So Catal Catalan stands for Catalyzing Brilliant Talent. For us, it's about having a platform. It's a platform that really helps companies take advantage of the resources they have access to and get the work done better. You and your co-founders are five years out of business school. If you had to go through business school all over again, what would you have done differently? I think taking advantage of some of the great professors and the experience that those professors have while you're there is actually really important. And it's, it's pretty easy to kind of go to class and then like check out a class, walk off campus, and forget about like the professors. When I think one of the most valuable things you have is the fact that these professors are there and they want to be able to give you like one-on-one -on -one time. They want to like dig into problems with you. And, um, and you got to take advantage of that. I wish I took more advantage of that. Pat, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Pat Petiti, co-founder and co-CEO of Catalan Technologies. Support for the language of business is from Boston University Questrom School of Business. We're also available as a podcast on Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for watching.